Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Copper to the World Conference, which like so many things has adapted to 2020 by moving online. We're very pleased you can join us. My name's Alex Blood, Executive Director of Mining within the Department for Energy and Mining, and I'm your MC for this afternoon. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ghana people who are the traditional owners of the land on which we host this webinar today, and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. The Government of South Australia is very proud to bring you this truly global copper industry event. Whilst an important mineral for its conductivity and flexibility, copper remains a vital mineral to support global efforts to move to a green energy, low emissions future. And we are very, very fortunate indeed to have world copper experts presenting to us this afternoon. This afternoon we'll play the following way. First, the South Australian Minister for Energy and Mining will provide our welcome address and officially launch, launch an exciting new partnership. We have three more wonderful speakers to provide the global update. Already, I must say, it's been a very exciting day for announcements, for which I will now update you. Oz Minerals announced today their approval to move to pre-feasibility for the Tarantina Block Cave expansion, which is a great story in South Australia. Western Sands, an explorer in the far west of South Australia, within the west, Western Gaul region, announced uh, the intersection of over 200 metres of nickel and copper sulfur at their Sahara project. And I can also proudly announce today that our very own Geological Survey of South Australia will be undertaking a new geoscience program with the CSI Road. This program will explore the sediments and health of copper assets in the Stuart Gulf, which for those of you that don't know the state, is the Olympic Dam region. This offers the potential of our mass deposits and will be a great to many of you. The way that today will work, between each presentation, we will have some questions and answers. There will be a question for you on the screen that you should be able to see. If you click on that, you should be able to see your question board. And I'll come back to those between speakers, and your input is most welcome. We'll also be hosting polls today. Each poll will pop up on the side of your screen, and all you need to do is click the answer. And as we go through to this afternoon's webinar, I'll read the poll results. And so, our very first poll question. And the question is, where can innovation deliver real improvements in the mining sector? I'll come back to those results after our first speaker, and so to the first speaker today. I would now like to welcome the South Australian Minister for Energy and Mining, the Honourable Dan Van Holt-Kelkham. Since assuming the portfolio in 2018, the Minister has overseen new energy initiatives that draw forward cities to copper, like the home battery scheme and the electric power plant. He has successfully started the mining work of the through Parliament and overseen the energy and industry COVID-19 pandemic measures which have enabled industry to operate in these challenging times, including the vital cross-border FIFO movement. The Minister holds the seat of Stuart, one of our largest electorates in South Australia, and covers over 330,000 square kilometres. The Minister will make some important announcements to share with partners today, which speaks to the state's focus on innovation, sustainability and growth. Thank you for joining us, Minister. Thank you, Alex, and thank you very much for having me. Um, you and your team do fantastic work all year round, uh, but you work extra hard uh, when it comes around to uh, Copper to the World. And of course, this year, Copper to the World online has probably tested you that little bit further, but I know this is gonna be a fantastic webinar. It's lovely to be here with other speakers, uh, other people from, from uh, you know, many parts of the world interested in Copper in general and Copper here in South Australia. I also acknowledge that here, uh, where I am at the moment in Adelaide, our capital city, this is the land of the Ghana people and that everywhere in Australia, everywhere we live, work, play, travel is Aboriginal land. Um, it's also uh, fantastic to have so many delegates. Thank you all for, for joining us. Absolutely tremendous that you've come with us and I know that this will be a, a terrific uh, event for you. You won't all be able to taste our fantastic wine and food or see our beautiful scenery this time, but with a little luck next year, the next Copper of the World will be again face to face here in Adelaide. South Australia values its national and international partnerships. We welcome your interest as we strive to become one of the world's most sustainable and technologically advanced mining regions. Through the pandemic, Australian copper producers have done a magnificent job. 
in keeping the supply coming forward. Producers have been agile, looking after people and taking up technology to continue production. Industry and government collaboration efforts have enabled South Australia to emerge as a safe and secure haven to live, work, and importantly, to invest. Copper is the essential element in the expanding global clean energy future. And South Australia hosts two thirds of Australia's copper resource. 50% of South Australia's electricity is already delivered by renewable energy, and that will be 85% in only five more years from now. With the influx of capabilities, the mining sector is here among the first to take on new energy solutions to power remote operations and reduce our carbon footprint. And combining the mining sector and renewable energy, it's my great pleasure on behalf of the South Australian Government to warmly welcome the official launch of the Warren Centre's new research paper titled Technology Roadmap of the Zero Emission Copper Mine of the Future. This research suggests that Australia can lead the world by ensuring that the supply of copper becomes significantly less carbon and water intensive over the next 20 to 30 years. So congratulations to the Warren Centre. It's also my great pleasure today to announce some world first projects which will help grow our mineral sector and attract international partners. Our government's accelerated discovery initiative has set a new benchmark for innovative co-funding options to stimulate exploration and discovery. The ADI's broad scope brings a strong emphasis on new technologies and upskilling to boost discovery and to reduce risk. And today I can share with you that all of the first round offers are awarded to 14 dynamic projects that will share in a total of 3 million Australian dollars in co-funded grants. These projects include testing for new styles of copper to open up new search spaces, sophisticated ways to look through the earth's cover where metal bearing mineral pathways might lie to better guide drilling, and the movement of heat in buried basement rock pointing to ore bodies. A number of the proposals are directed at promising targets in frontier districts and include diverse locations across the state. The ADI was significantly oversubscribed with many high quality proposals. In coming weeks, we will confirm the timing and funding amount earmarked for a second round call for expressions of interest uh, before the year's end. We have another $7 million on top of the $3 million just mentioned for two more rounds. So I encourage further applications, including from people and organizations who may have applied for round one, but couldn't be fit into the $3 million round one cap. A big, a big boom in machine learning and artificial intelligence promises to change the investment landscape and to bring forward prized mineral discoveries. In full swing now is our global crowdsourcing competition, Explore SA, the Gawler Challenge, which we announced at last year's Copper to the World Conference here in Adelaide. A partnership between the South Australian Government and Unearthed, this competition has put out a worldwide call for data scientists and geologists to come together. Desktop research is perfect for, perfect for these COVID times, and Explore SA has already attracted over 2,000 global innovators, bringing fresh ideas to the program. New approaches, the best technology, and data can deliver better and faster investment decisions. Data prizes were awarded recently, and the major prize categories will be announced later this month. Celebrating success. 2019 was a very positive year for exploration in South Australia. BHP continued to drill its outstanding Oak Dam discovery with 3% copper at 425 metres and as much as 6 to 8% in other intersections. This globally significant discovery points to the significant production opportunities that await. Another point of pride, at the height of the pandemic, Prominent Hill, operated by Oz Minerals, became the first mine in the world to trial a tele-remote operation for exploration drilling underground, a brilliant showcase. 
And before the pandemic broke, it was fabulous to see South Australia's ascent to sixth ranking in the world for investment attractiveness in the latest Fraser Institute's annual survey of mining. Last year, copper operators injected more than $1.5 billion of capital investment, which is a very healthy boost to our state's copper production sustainability. Only this month, the first copper concentrate from South Australia's newest copper mine, Carapatina, was shipped through the Wyala steel port. Not only an important milestone for Carapatina and for Oz Minerals, opening of this port up to third parties is a terrific development as well, as it is located on the doorstep of our copper-rich Gawler Creighton. And BHP is proposing a staged increase in copper production at Olympic Dam from 200,000 tonnes per year to a potential 300,000 tonnes per year. Innovation and smart technologies are an absolute priority to transform the way copper and other commodity mining works and to stay at the cutting edge. This is also true for petroleum, exploration and the renewable energy sector. Deep alliances with complementary industries can make all the difference to having productive, safe operations and vibrant equipment and technology supply chains. It's now my pleasure to announce that South Australian Government is the foundation partner with private company Core Innovation Hub, or Core. This public-private partnership was initiated with support from the South Australian Government's Economic and Business Growth Fund. The Core Innovation Hub will be at the heart of the Lot 14 Innovation Neighbourhood within Stone and Chalk's Startup Hub to activate new style solutions in energy and resources. Lot 14 is a half a billion dollar investment, transforming this incredible space and attracting global innovators. This leading precinct fuses the talents across space, defense, data science, integrated solutions, robotics, cyberspace, machine learning, and startups. So it's a perfect fit for core and for the activation of energy and resources innovation and the transference of new ideas and solutions. CORE will embed a culture of entrepreneurship, open innovation, trust and collaboration, working with industry, startups, METs, innovators and researchers to support innovation and new data and technology skills acquisition within the energy and resources industries. CORE will also operate at our vibrant Tonsley Innovation Precinct, home to our world famous Drill Core Library. The Tonsley Innovation Precinct is also home to automation, renewables, hydrogen, software and advanced manufacturing opportunities and developments. So to tell us more, it's my pleasure to introduce CORE's South Australian State Manager, Renee Huckendorf. Uh, Renee will give you a sense of the exciting things that CORE has planned for us and for our innovation and, and energy and mining sectors. And Renee, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here uh, to, the, to the podium. Thank you, Minister, for that wonderful introduction and for inviting us along today. In South Australia, we have a local energy and resources industry well placed to lead the world in innovation and where it is widely accepted that innovation will drive the next wave of productivity gains and financial growth. Our goal at CORE is to foster an environment where innovation thrives and where innovators are actively supported to develop the technologies of tomorrow, building industry capabilities and contributing to the state's growth agenda. After four successful years in WA, we are thrilled to be expanding in South Australia with the support of the South Australian Department for Energy and Mining. CORE's SA operations will be based at Lot 14 on North Terrace with a satellite office at the Tonsley Innovation District. Together we will build an engaged and dynamic community, collaborating with intent along the energy and resources value chain. As part of the launch today, we have released a digital innovation ecosystem map, compiled initially from open source data. If you're based in SA or conducting business here, we encourage you to visit the CORE Innovation Ecosystem Map and add your business. We've also released exclusive discounts for our professional development programs on our Future Skills Marketplace for individuals and organisations. Check your conference pack for more information about the Core Innovation Hub 
and we look forward to hearing from innovators and energy and resources businesses who are keen to engage in the core innovation hub community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee, and a fantastic partnership between the South Australian Government and Core Innovation. Very, very thrilled to be embarking upon this together. Uh, now, hand back to you, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, and congratulations, Renee, for your launch today and to the rest of the Core team in Western Australia. We now have an opportunity for some questions. So again, if you would like to ask a question, you click on the question tab and you can type them in. So I will, I've got a couple here. Um, one I will ask is, Minister, I just wondered, reflecting on COVID-19 and the industry's response to COVID-19, how do you feel that the sector performed um, during the pandemic in terms of keeping supply chain coming uh, in a steady state for the sector? Um, look, I think the sector, standingly, to be perfectly honest, uh, operators throughout the uh, the resources and the energy sector um, were the first, to be quite blunt, uh, of, of a wide range of industries to get themselves organised, to collaborate, uh, to determine exactly what their needs were and how best to articulate those needs. And I'm thinking not only with regard to intrastate and intra-Australia um, operations, but also with regard to crossing state borders and in some very, very few instances, international borders. Um, but, you know, our, our sector uh, really stood out with the way it worked together and said, well, look, if we can't get some of our people across a border or uh, if, a, if a team or a half of a team needs to leave a workplace because of a concern about health, um, who could cover for who? How can we work together? How can we help each other? And it was a really a tremendous example of uh, organisations um, in, in collaborative supply chains doing better than ever and organisations which are normally uh, competitors actually coming together for the common good during this time. Um, your, uh, your department's uh, focus, your division's focus, Alex, was uh, incredibly important too with regard to engaging with industry and with uh, the police and the health authorities. And I'd like to particularly acknowledge Martin Reed, uh, without whose work, um, industry would not have been able to get nearly as many people in and out of South Australia for the work that they needed to do. So, Alex, uh, fantastic work by industry, but tremendous work by your team as well. That's very kind of you, uh, Minister. And just one more uh, question. This is around, I guess, innovation. Uh, so potentially, Renee, you may have some comments too. You've seen that the ADI and the Explore the Gawler and in, indeed the work that Oz Minerals have done in 2019 have focused on this innovation for the next resource. It's exciting times. How important do you think innovation is for minerals discovery? Well, let me give a quick answer and then hand over to, to Renee. Look, look, it's absolutely vital. Um, if you think in a, in a very simplistic way, you know, you go back uh, 50, 100 years, prospectors uh, banging rocks with hammers and kicking a bit of dirt around and deciding that they think from their, their experience and, and very good experience um, that this is the place to drill a hole. Moving through um, to, to where we are today, where we want to be able to offer information and tools and knowledge and ways of interrogating um, data and other facts so that industry's exploration dollars can be driven so much further. It's quite extraordinary where we've come to. And our accelerated discovery initiative, while it certainly still could go towards people, uh, you know, wanting funding support to drill holes, that's not ruled out. It's not only that. You know, only a few short years ago, that's really what a program like this was about. But now it also includes extraordinary innovation, artificial intelligence, um, interrogation of data, even supply chain logistics improvements. Uh, we are doing everything we can in partnership with industry to, to drive every exploration dollar further, to make the dollar that's spent uh, either do more or to be more productive, to actually have a much higher chance of success. Because we know that when we can contribute to that, we contribute to getting up and running operational producing mines much quicker. And I'll hand over to Renee for, for her answer to that question. 
Thank you, Minister. I think you've covered a lot of those points well. Um, uh, I can add uh, the, digi the digital age is here. Um, uh, it's not the future we're talking about. It's right now. The opportunity is right now. And we want to help industry to see it as an opportunity, not as a threat, to capitalise on that um, for what they do with their businesses in the future, to build the capability, the community and the capacity to be able to uh, take their business forward and solve the challenges for the industry in the future. Thanks, Renee. And I promise this is the last question for um, for you in particular, Minister, but I'll be interested if Renee has a comment. The question that has come in says, what can government do to increase or support elaborate transformation manufacturing of raw materials in Australia generated from raw materials mined in South Australia? Yeah, um, look, fantastic question and a big question, an enormous question. I mean, people have been contemplating that for years and years. Um, you know, we, we uh, export an enormous amount of raw, raw materials, not only in, in, in the you know, minerals and petroleum sector, and then import the, the, the more refined products. Um, one of the things that we believe that we can do to help that is with regard to uh, sustainable, reliable, affordable, renewable energy. When we get to the stage where uh, we can rely on, on enormous amounts of renewable energy with a free fuel source able to, to be injected into manufacturing or processing or, or value adding opportunities, then all of a sudden we've closed the gap in, in a large way. And let me just be very clear, gas will be with us for a very long time. I'm not ruling out gas, but over time, uh, we will have more and more renewable energy. When we, we, we see that with regard to wind or solar, potentially hydrogen and a range of other uh, renewables, when we have this fuel source, um, that means that we can grab back our competitive advantage. So, um, you know, we've got the iron ore. If we have the cheap, clean energy, and if the customers for steel are demanding green, clean steel, and we've got the renewable energy here, then we have a huge advantage compared to most parts of the world with regard to turning that iron ore into steel, into the green steel, which overseas customers require, will require, and then we export the steel instead of the iron ore or in place of a lot of it. Now, there are many, many examples like that, but to my mind, it does hinge on overseas customers demanding products, refined you know, processed products, uh, which have used renewable energy in their creation, and then we have a big head start to turn our raw materials with our renewable energy into those processed products for export. Renee? Uh, I just want to say thank you for having us today and this wonderful opportunity to uh, launch the Core Innovation Hub in South Australia. We're very privileged to join the conference today and please enjoy the rest of the agenda. Thanks, Renee. Thank you, Renee, and thank you, Minister, for your presentations. And many congratulations again to the to the talk to the core team. And now we will, before we go to our very first, uh, our first, it's our second speaker. Um, if we can announce the poll results. So the question that we asked is, where can innovation deliver real improvements to the sector? The screen should come up for you now to see the results. The very interesting um, accelerated exploration is 26%. Sustainability at 23.6, which I'm sure Michelle will be very interested to talk about um, through the copper mark that she will be addressing, and asset productivity at 20%. So there's a really good indication, and, and actually I, I reflect on this, and I hope that you take away some answers and some information today that actually may aid your thinking around particularly some of the sustainability and the productivity questions. Thank you. But we have another poll that we won coming up at the end of each section. And so our next poll question is, where can the South Australian copper sector and the wider mining sector show global leadership? That's a big question and that we can't not focus on what Craig's going to say, but that gives you something to think about. And so now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Craig Lang. Craig is a Principal Analyst at CIU Group, and he'll be sharing with us the global outlook for copper and emerging with resilience through COVID-19. He's a Principal Analyst with CIU's Base Metals team, which is located in Singapore. 
His focus is on the analysis of the global copper industry as well as zinc, lead and nickel. With more than 15 years experience as a commodity and equity research anal analysis, he's covered the mining and metal sector. Now, before Craig starts talking, just remember, if you would like to ask questions, please click on your question tab and you can type. The floor is yours, Craig. Thanks, Alex, and thanks to the organisers of the Copper to the World Conference for the opportunity to uh, represent CRU and to present our views, um, particularly at this interesting time as um, you know, COVID-19 impacts the global copper market and present our views as to the impact on the market currently and how we see um, the copper sector emerging from COVID-19 as well as the, the medium term outlook. Um, for those that aren't aware of CRU, CRU delivers business intelligence across uh, a range of commodities across mining, metals and fertilisers um, with businesses across analysis, prices, consulting and, and events. And last year we celebrated 50 years um, since the company was founded. So just past uh, the legal notice. So we'll start with a recap of recent moves in the copper price. Um, we saw last year, around about May, the trade uh, war between US and China really escalated with US uh, placing a significant amount of tariffs on Chinese goods and saw the copper price, which at the time was around $6,500 per tonne, uh, fall back towards $5,700 per tonne. And then through last year, it was quite a challenging year for copper markets because uh, mainly the impact on global trade and there's particularly the impact on developed markets um, as we waited to see whether uh, the two biggest um, uh, economies in the world, US and China, could reach uh, an agreement uh, on the trade front. And then as we got towards the end of last year and into January this year, a phase one deal was reached and that saw copper price go back above $6,000 per tonne. But then unfortunately, uh, COVID impacted, uh, firstly impacting China. So it's that first uh, leg down around about February, where it fell back below 6,000 down towards uh, $5,600 uh, per tonne. And then when COVID spread to the rest of the world with around about a two to three month lag, um, we saw that other major leg down in March. And prices temporarily got uh, into the 4,000s towards around about 4,600 around uh, 23rd of March, I think it was. But then since then, uh, prices have recovered uh, very sharply and they're, they're now back up to $5,800 per tonne. Now, that reflects a number of factors. One is China was relatively quick in addressing COVID, um, flattening the curve and um, seeing its economy recover from the impact of the, the virus. Um, the US dollar, since that low point for the copper price uh, in March, US dollar depreciated, it fell against a range of uh, commodity producer currencies. For example, the Australian dollar has strengthened by around about 20% since that low point. And the currencies of like the Chilean peso, uh, Indonesian rupiah and, and other um, mining, uh, copper mining currencies have uh, recovered somewhat. So that's provided some support to the cost curve, which again supports the price. And just generally it's just seen a, a bit of a recovery in uh, risk sentiment as uh, the rest of the world starts to emerge from, from lockdown. On the right side, that more looks at the commodity uh, futures positioning and most recently the market was uh, slightly net short copper futures. So this chart on the left looks at this, the uh, cumulative growth or decline in copper inventories. These are visible copper inventories across major exchanges and warehouses. Um, a starting point for this chart is that when we entered this year before COVID impacted, global copper inventories, uh, visible inventories, were at around about their lowest level since uh, mid-2009. So, you know, and that was what we've seen across a number of metals that we entered this year uh, with very low visible inventories, and that's helped to absorb some of the impact on the demand side from COVID. And this chart, what it shows is, from January through to December, how do global inventories um, track through the year? And normally you see inventories increase for the first few months, peak in March, and um, which is what happened this year, and then decline through to around about October uh, before uh, bottoming and, and increasing through to March the following year. And this year has been no different. Um, there was a bit of an increase, uh, bigger than normal, bigger than the 11-year median. I've shown there the, the gold line, which is 2020. 
Um, but inventories have since come down, and in particular driven by China's uh, demand for copper. Uh, China's visible com uh, copper inventories have declined by over 300,000 tonnes since uh, mid-April. And on the right side, this chart shows the China refined cathode uh, import premiums. It's been quite a volatile series recently. Um, prices ran up uh, around about a month ago uh, to above $100 per tonne. Then they declined back into the 60s. And now in the past week, actually, it's back up to the 90 to $100 per tonne range. So uh, the key takeaway there is there's still uh, significant demand for copper cathode in the Chinese market and uh, China accounts for around about half of global copper consumption, so around about 12 million tonnes a year. This chart looks at the trajectory for China and the rest of the world and our assessment of the demand impact uh, through the COVID period and the recovery um, through the rest of this year and into next year. So as we saw, China uh, got impacted mostly in the first quarter uh, we estimated about an 18% decline in year-on-year -year in refined copper demand. And we saw that with um, semi-fabricators and other consumers of uh, copper cathode, their utilisation rates fell to around about 40 45%. But they've since returned back to normal levels very quickly. And they're now uh, typically in the range 80 to 90. It's why that yellow line we have uh, in Q2 returning back to growth very quickly for the Chinese market. Um, and the black line is for the rest of the world. We're seeing a one quarter lagged impact, a slightly shallower decline, negative 12%, uh, but then a, a slower trajectory, a slower recovery um, as you know, the, the countries impacted by COVID take, take a bit longer to um, return back to normal levels of um, consumption. So on a full year basis, we have Chinese demand down at the refined level down 2% and for the rest of the world down 6%. As I mentioned earlier, China is around about 50% of refined copper consumption. So on a global basis, um, we have 2020 refined copper demand down about 4%. Um, and as we sit here today, each, as each day goes by each week, we get new um, sources of data and new data points. And the latest is that um, it seems that China's economy is recovering even stronger than what we've uh, factored into those numbers. And perhaps the rest of the world impact as well uh, is looking the chance there might be some upside to our estimates there as well. Um, and just to look at 2021, we have a 5.2% recovery uh, for the rest of the world next year growth and 3.7% for, for, for China. So that's 2021 refined copper consumption. If we look at the trajectory, the black line is our expectations for global refined copper consumption um, prior to COVID. And then the yellow line is our revised forecast. So we estimate around about a 1.4 million tonne impact on what was around about a 24 million tonne market um, due to COVID. And we do see the market recovering back onto a similar growth trajectory. Um, but there will be some consumption which is permanently lost. So we'll be down around about 0.8 million tonnes, uh, lower than what we were expecting at the start of this year, uh, over the medium term, so by 2024. Um, so we are expecting some recovery, um, but the global uh, copper consumption has transitioned onto a lower path because of COVID. This looks at consumption on a regional basis, and the key takeaways here are uh, in 2020, we've seen at least a 5% decline across pretty much every region, um, and then uh, a bounce back off a lower base next year. So for, for most regions, we're seeing uh, around a similar um, growth in 2021. For India, India a little bit higher. Um, that reflects the severity of their lockdown um, this year. So. Uh, they had a very strict lockdown, and so that's particularly impacted demand this year, but that's why we've got uh, recovery 15% next year versus probably what will be a trend of around about 10% growth in the medium term. Whenever you see a market in a crisis period where prices collapse, you know, there's always going to be um, some response on the supply side. And this chart basically shows the mine and smelter disruptions across the, across the copper industry. 
Um, so to date, at the mine level, we've seen around about 430,000 tonnes of uh, announced uh, mine cutbacks. And those cutbacks, um, the mine disruptions are due to governments um, enforcing uh, companies to you know, stop producing because of coronavirus as well as logistical issues. Um, at the smelter level, we're seeing almost 200,000 tonne impacts, so relatively small. Um, and uh, on the right side, that shows regionally which, which mines have been um, impacted most heavily. And the key takeaway there is that Peru uh, has been most impacted to date. Uh, the risk is that Chile, which is the largest copper producer, um, the impact to date has been relatively small despite uh, a large number of coronavirus cases. Um, and we've seen in the news in recent days that um, there have been some negotiations between unions and the major copper producer in Chile. Um, so perhaps there are some risks further that um, we'll see some more um, disruption risk due to coronavirus with some of these other um, copper producers. I won't go through this in too much detail, but it basically splits the coronavirus uh, impact uh, between uh, the current disruption, so it's 434,000 tonnes. What we expect some further disruptions, 125, and then productivity losses. So you know, mines um, operating on a lot of productivity levels as they recover from the virus in the second half of this year. That's 150,000 tonne impact. Uh, on the bottom side of that left chart, uh, they're price-related cutbacks. Now, so, so far we've heard around about 159,000 tonne of price-related cutbacks. That perhaps has been lower than normal because the copper price uh, was very quick to recover from the impact from its downturn. As we saw in the first slide, uh, the price stayed below 5,000 uh, very briefly and is, is now back up to $5,800 per tonne. The chart on the right shows the global cash cost curve and normally uh, the 90th percentile provides a floor for the, for the copper price. Um, and it's only really when there is a, a major downturn, a major crisis event, the copper price uh, falls below it. And when it does, it, it tends to fall down towards the 75th percentile. So, and you can see the copper cost curve is relatively steep. Um, so um, when there is a uh, decline in production or decline, uh, th then the impact uh, can, can be quite significant. Um, that provides a bit of indication. If we are to see coronavirus, the second major wave, Again, um, you know, prices would fall back towards that level and it will be dependent, uh, the recovery will be dependent on uh, the rate at which supply responds. This chart looks at, uh, on the left side, CapEx guidance. So most of the major miners have reduced their CapEx guidance for this year, capital expenditure, by between 15 and 30%. Uh, the major miners are listed there. So there's some deferral of projects due to coronavirus, as well as the impact of um, you know, government enforced restrictions, and some part of it is due to uh, currency effects as well. On the right side, we show the major uh, committed mine projects. Um, I won't go through those all, all in detail, but I will provide a bit more analysis on coming slides. So this chart on the left looks at the copper price back to 2009, and really tries to highlight that when you have a period of price decline like we had between 2011 and 2016. Uh, there really weren't a lot of major projects which got approved. And then going into 2017, 2018, there was a cluster, of, you know, all these projects, you know, significant projects got approved when the copper price went back above $66,000 per tonne. Um, so the takeaway from here is, is if prices were to remain below $6,000 per tonne, then globally, just due to the uncertainty, we think that um, um, company, company boards will perhaps wait to see the copper price recover somewhat before they give the go-ahead for um, new, new sources of supply, new projects. And on the right panel, it shows uncommitted projects um, above 50,000 tonnes, and we classify those as probable and possible. There's quite a lot going into this, uh, going on in this uh, slide, but if I split it into two halves, the three charts on the top half look at committed projects, and the three on the bottom look at those that have yet to receive um, uh, approval from company boards. So going to the top uh, charts, those projects which have already been uh, committed to, 
uh, account for around about 6% of supply by 2022 and 12% by 2024. And if we look at a scenario where we say brownfield expansions get delayed by three months and greenfield uh, projects, new copper projects get delayed by uh, six months, you can see from 2021 to 2023, we've seen around about 200,000 tonne per year impact, which will go some way towards um, eliminating our forecast uh, surpluses over that period. So it's quite significant. And um, those projects are shown on the right panel uh, of that uh, slide there. And going down to the bottom left, if we look at uncommitted projects, uh, they affect more into the you know, medium to longer term. So they're about 7% of supply by 2027 and 14% by 2030. Again, if we see probable projects get pushed back by six months because of the uncertainty, um, possible projects by 12 months and more speculative projects by 24 months, then by 2030, we expect that to have a significant impact of uh, 540,000 tonnes less than what we're currently uh, projecting in our base case. And those projects that fit under that category um, are on the right side there. So to sum up, just to look at the medium term for mine production growth for copper, we have a negative four and a half percent impact in 2020, which primarily affects the impact uh, of the virus, uh, but then recovering off a lower base, five percent growth uh, next year, and uh, the 2.8 percent, 2.7 percent the following years after that, uh, and then growth just due to the uncertainty in terms of the timing of projects falls off a bit in 2024. On the right side, most of those projects are coming from the concentrates route. Um, the alternative route of production, which is uh, sovereign extraction electro winning uh, projects, we're seeing a decline of around about 6% per annum over the medium term. And that primarily reflects uh, a lot of these projects in Africa, which ramped up very quickly mind the high grade deposits, um, particularly with the high cobalt price in recent years, um, then having to mine lower grade parts of the oil body and that uh, affecting the, the medium term outlook. So on the concentrate market side, uh, we see the copper concentrate market remaining in deficit over the medium term and quite substantial deficits. These are unadjusted deficits. So they look at how much do copper smelters, um, how much feed do they require, how much copper concentrates, and how much is available based on our projections for mine supply. And before adjusting smelter utilisation rates, that's showing you know, a true indication of how tight we see the market. And that's reflected in the chart on the right side, where we see the treatment charges, which is and refining charges, which is what the smelters and refiners get paid for, for that metal. We're actually on uh, been trending down lower in recent years, um, reflecting uh, tight supply. And our expectations are that the market will remain uh, relatively tight compared to historical over the medium term. So across smelter projects, um, if you see on the left side, most of these projects are in China. Um, there's a couple of committed projects, but most are probable and possible. Uh, there's a lot of projects to go through, but the point that I'd highlight is for some of these Chinese uh, smelter projects, the replacement of um, old lines which have been shutting down um, with new capacity. So it's just a small amount of incremental growth there. Uh, a couple of the phase two expansions in 2023, um, they're perhaps at risk of getting pushed back a little bit further. And if we look at the Indonesian smelters, um, Sambawa, the Indonesian government has mandated that um, the Indonesian producers will no longer be able to export concentrate and have to build smelters. And they're on track for, they were on track for the end of 2023, but now um, the parent company uh, of Amman Mineral, which owns the Sambawa project, that's uh, indicated in their May update of a delay of 12 to 18 months for that project. And uh, Freeport uh, announced that due to coronavirus, the aggressive smelter has also been impacted somewhat, but um, no quantification of the delay there. Um, the other smelter, which is of interest to global copper market, is Tuti Corin, which is in India. That shut down two years ago because of um, uh, community concerns with regards to the environment. And um, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to when that will restart. And you know, the latest we're hearing is it will take at least nine to 12 months, even if it was to get the go ahead. Um, just due to the fact that the, the owners haven't had access to the asset. 
and um, it could uh, require a significant rebuild before it's ready to produce. So this chart on the right looks at blister production growth, which is the form of copper which the smelters uh, produce. Um, we've got a 2% contraction this year and then returning to around about 3 to 5% growth over the medium term. So looking at the refined copper market uh, balance, we have seen um, smallish deficits in recent years. And now looking to this year, we're expecting around about a 400,000 tonne surplus. Um, and over the next three years, um, deficit uh, surpluses around about 180, 170 and 118,000 tonnes. And to keep in context, the global copper market at the moment is around about 23 uh, million tonnes of consumption. So they're not particularly huge surpluses, um, but they will weigh on prices in the near term. Um, as I mentioned in that slide, which looked at projects, if we do see a number of these projects, both at the mine level and smelter level, get pushed back, it'll push back supply, and um, that quite easily um, could see that that uh, surplus um, uh, could be lower than what we're currently projected. If we do see those to see those delays come through, and this chart looks at our current price projections and most recently published uh, over a month ago versus um, what our expectations were at the start of the year. And for this year and next year, um, we've got the price tracking around about the 90th percentile of the global cash cost curve, which tends to be uh, the price that you see during a, a downturn period uh, where miners cut back on sustaining capex. And then from 2022 to 2024, we've got prices tracking the 90th percentile of the all-in sustaining cost curve. Uh, the risk to, in the near term to those numbers is to the upside, just given how quickly China has recovered. Um, and like I said, we're seeing prices already back to $5,800 per tonne. But it is quite uh, an uncertain time for the markets as we wait to see whether coronavirus has a, a significant second wave. If it does, um, there'll be a significant risk reversal um, and the US dollar will strengthen and that again would put pressure on the copper prices. So. It's quite an interesting time for copper, um, but we do have prices recovering significantly over the medium term as the market emerges uh, from coronavirus. So just to conclude quickly, we see refined copper demand set to decline by 4% this year, which is the steepest downturn since the 1980s. Uh, Chinese demand is recovering uh, quicker than expected. The mine disruptions have been uh, increasing, but they've been lower than the impact on demand, uh, which is what you normally see during a major downturn, the demand, the demand impact, um, which is what you feel first, that's uh, more significant and it takes uh, longer for the supply spot response to come. Um, but because China's demand has recovered very quickly, that's supported the copper price and perhaps has taken some of the heat off uh, those high cost producers to, to stop operating um, those mines. We do see mine project development will be impacted um, due to, directly due to the COVID related disruptions and the reduction in CapEx due to the uncertain outlook. Uh, and for the concentrates market, we expect it to remain tight. Um, and for the refined copper market, we expect to see uh, surpluses over the short to medium term. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, we expect the prices to hover around about 5,300 per tonne uh, over the next year or two. Uh, capped by the 90th percentile of the cash cost curve, which is uh, historically has been the equilibrium price in a surplus market. Uh, but going forward over the medium term, expect price to recover back towards $6,600 per tonne in 2024, um, which is still less than what we estimate is a price of around about $7,000 per tonne to incentivise uh, new mine capacity. So thanks very much uh, for, for listening and I'll hand you over to the moderator. Thanks, Craig, that was really interesting. Um, we have had some questions come through. You can now ask them questions, so type away. I, I will try to pick up on them. But one has come um, through for you, Craig. And this is the question. What is the likelihood China will impose tariffs on Australian copper to respond to Australian scrutiny of the COVID outbreak? as they have seemingly done with some other Australian exports? And clearly we've started with a simple question first. Yeah, uh, I've only seen a fairly low probability because China really needs the copper units and 
it's already a challenging enough time with um, COVID impacting supply from those big um, key producers in South America. Um, and it's really China, one of the reasons why in that slide I was talking about the China um, cathode import premium has, has uh, increased significantly uh, recently. And that's indicative of how much you know, copper they need. So they need 12 million tonne of, of copper per year to, to feed their domestic consumption. Um, so for, for that reason, um, I, don't, I don't think that they would impose tariffs. Um, we've seen that they've, with the area that they've cracked down has been more related on the environmental side, and that's been on the scrap supply. So you have two sources of supply. One is from mines, and the other is to take, say, old uh, cable, remove the plastic, and then you know, recycle the copper in those cables. Um, they've shifted the production from that secondary processing, processing to other countries over the past two or so years. And um, there's some changes there, but they are issuing import quotas and, and that side of the, of the market um, hasn't really been particularly impacted. Again, reflective of the fact that China needs the, the copper units. Thanks, Craig. I just have one other last question, and this is a bit of an unusual one, but it's a good question. Um, with copper's antimicrobial properties flagged as having a prime place in the healthcare industry and common in serious disease, do you think there's any potential for those properties to impact copper demand moving forward in this year's pandemic? Um, yeah, I have done a bit of reading and there is certainly uh, the antimicrobial properties of copper and it does it should benefit demand, particularly um, you know, going forward as economies look for more you know, permanent solutions to address um, the, the virus impact. Uh, the issue is, is it's probably off a pretty low base. So you know, more than half of uh, global COP consumption is driven more by construction uh, and infrastructure related sectors. Um, so we do see, to see significant growth, but if you look at the starting point for where that application is today, it would be you know, a very small percentage. So it's growing off a very low base and perhaps in the context of a 23, 24 million tonne global copper market, uh, it's not you know, large tonnages. Thanks, Craig. Thanks very much for your time today and for calling in from Singapore. And Thanks, now, Alex. Welcome. It's now to look to the poll results. So the poll results should pop up on your screen. And the question was, where can the South Australian copper sector and wider mining sector show global leadership? So hopefully you can all see that on your screens. Now, interesting, sustainability has come out top at nearly 40%, followed by innovation. It's quite interesting given our first question and sustainability came in roughly second in terms of that. So there seems to be a correlation in your thinking and how you're looking at problem solving. And it's also aligns, I guess, with the work that a company like Core Innovation does, as well as Lot 14 and Tonsley, the importance of that innovation partnership to find new solutions, whether that be cleaner, greener, more cost effective, more productive. But very interesting. We do have another poll. And the next poll question is, is carrying on, I guess, from Craig's topic. And the question is, will copper prices recover post COVID or is the global copper market weighed down by other pre-existing issues? As you can see, we've gone out of our way to pick easy, light-hearted questions. And so now I will go to our third speaker and introduce Michelle Bruhart, Executive Director of the Copper Mark. The increasing focus on responsibly sourcing metals and communicating that to the marketplace is exactly Michelle's expertise. He has extensive experience working on the design, implementation and independent assessment of sustainability standards. He has evaluated and assisted companies at every level of the supply chain, from raw material to end product and across multiple materials. Michelle was previously the Director of Innovations at the Responsible Minerals Initiative and served as the Head of Auditing at RCS Global for several years. For those of you who don't know, the copper mark is a potent symbol of the trend where product prices reflect the ethical and sustainable aspects of production. From launch to global implementation, Michelle will now bring us a progress report on the copper mark. The floor is yours, Michelle. 
Thank you very much, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks so much for, for having me and giving us an opportunity to talk a little bit about the copper mark um, in this in this really interesting webinar. Um, I think a lot of, of the drivers for why you see the copper mark today have already been mentioned actually in, in the through the poll um, with sustainability being one of the key areas mentioned, um, but also through previous speakers and, and really we're seeing an increasing trend that responsible production of metals, not just copper, but um, including copper, is becoming a market expectation. So rather than it being a nice to have or a distinguishing factor, it's, it's expected to be the way um, minerals and metals are produced. Um, we're seeing that demand coming from various sources. Um, again, it's not just media reports or NGOs, it's increasingly investors um, with the London Metals Exchange last year issuing a new policy on res unresponsible sourcing um, metals exchanges have started to demand um, that those metals are indeed produced and sourced responsibly and then of course we're seeing a lot of interest particularly in the case of copper to ensure that metals and minerals that are used in the transition to a clean and, and greener economy um, are also produced in a clean and green um, fashion and so the copper mark is essentially a response to those drivers from the copper industry to ensure that we are able to demonstrate um, the copper industry's contribution to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and particularly Goal 12 on responsible consumption and production, um, but really to provide a credible framework through which the industry is able to demonstrate responsible production practices. So the copper mark was initially developed and funded by the International Copper Association. So it has um, grown out of the industry um, and it has become a separate organization late 2019 as it was incorporated as, as a separate entity, um, which is now functioning with its own governance structure that includes a strong multi-stakeholder input through a multi-stakeholder advisory council. As you can see, on the slide here, can we provide an assurance framework for the copper industry? Um, we start with the Sustainable Development Goal 12 as our kind of foundation and our basis, and that is really to reflect the key demand from stakeholders for responsible production practices. Um, so since 2017, um, the cost of the copper market has started within the copper industry and there has been a lot of engagement with the external stakeholders um, across the, the board in terms of end user um, companies, investors, again, financial institutions, non-governmental associations, civil society organizations. And one of the key demands that we have heard from stakeholders is the need to demonstrate improved conditions on the ground. So how do we create that positive impact for the communities in which we do business? How do we improve the lives of the um, very people that are affected by the production of copper? And so that is indeed how we've gotten to focus on responsible production in, in our early um, stage of, of our launch and, and now growth of the copper mark. The way within the copper mark we look at responsible production is by adopting a comprehensive set of, of requirements that we would expect um, any copper producer, so mining, smelting, or refining to adopt. Um, we're aware that there is a lot of existing initiatives and standards around responsible um, mineral production um, that already exist and have been put in place for quite some time. So there's a conscious decision for the copper mark to use an existing set of requirements rather than going out and defining a new standard. And what we've done is we've adopted the risk readiness assessment that was created and is owned by the Responsible Minerals Initiative. The risk readiness assessment is a set of um, what we call industry norms or criteria across 32 environmental, social and governance areas. So it covers all major issue areas, including things like uh, renewable energy, greenhouse gas emissions, um, water management, biodiversity, but also more uh, human rights related aspects, business and human rights, supply chain due diligence, um, all the major topics are really covered. What's unique about the risk readiness assessment and, and which is something that we've uh, felt was really powerful for us to use is that 
the expectations are themselves derived from the requirements of over 40 existing standards that are applied in mineral supply chains. So again, rather than it being a new standard that's being drafted and developed, this is really looking at everything that already exists in the mineral space. What are all these existing um, best practice standards? And it looks at what are the commonly defined expectations in those standards. And that's what's then translated into the risk readiness assessment um, and with that applied for the copper mark. So of course, what we're looking for is, is not just a set of requirements, um, but what we're really looking for is how these are implemented at the site level by copper producers and to provide a mechanism to independently verify that indeed these requirements are met um, but again, also to help copper producers communicate to their investors, to their customers, and to the consumers that copper is produced responsibly. We have developed and are now implementing an assurance process. Um, and what you see here is, is a cycle that we hope will lead to continuous improvements um, at each of the participating copper sites. Um, so we require a clear commitment from companies to sign up for each individual copper producing site um, to our process, there is a self-assessment to start and get a sense of um, the performance against these 32 criteria. There is a requirement for an independent site level assessment that must be completed in order for any site to be able to carry the copper mark. And there is a, a um, reasonable amount of time to allow for improvement um, plans to be implemented, so for any gaps to be identified and addressed, um, as well as an expectation that once you have achieved conformance with the requirements of the copper mark, that you will then undergo a regular reassessment. And so that's a three-year cycle within which the site would have to undergo a reassessment. It's also a three-year cycle for us to review the criteria that we apply. And so we do expect to see as um, expectations continue to be uh, strengthened that in the conditions and the uh, performance on the ground continues to improve as well. Some of the key uh, benefits that we see for, for different stakeholders to participate in the copper mark, I've already mentioned some of those that we see for copper producers, but something we've seen um, across different industries as well is just a, a core benefit of a collective approach to defining objectives for the industry. So again, this definition of what do we understand when we say responsible production practices? What are the actual expectations that the industry would hold itself accountable to? Um, and then where do we go from that foundation of responsible practices? How do we make sure conditions really improve that we demonstrate that impact on the ground we're looking for? Oftentimes we find that copper producers are actually already implementing many of these management systems and have um, good practices on the ground already. And so then what we can offer with the copper mark is a, a way to communicate that um, through the independent verification, through a framework that is um, developed and has the input of, of various stakeholders and is, is considered credible by external stakeholders. So that again facilitates the communication of practices where they are already in place. Um, I will speak a little more about the way that we've designed the system to leverage existing efforts um, and initiatives. So again, we're, we're very aware of the, the, the landscape within which we operate and the fact that there is already a lot of efforts and a lot of different um, certificates and assurances and, and systems out there that we can build on and, and learn from. We also um, encourage particularly value chain partners in the copper value chains. Again, um, whether that be fabricators, manufacturers, end users, investors to join us as copper mark partners. Um, copper mark partners are organizations that clearly commit to our mission and vision and that um, support copper mark producers by um, giving preference in their supply chain to those that have undergone the assurance process. So for copper mark partners, we again can provide the assurance that copper in their value chain is produced responsibly, conforms with those responsible production um, criteria. And what we're seeing as well is the importance to start connecting interested companies. So we again, we see a lot of interest in responsible production. We see increasingly interest 
by end user industries as well to understand well how is copper produced where is it produced what are some of the issues that we may want to focus on and so one of the ways that we can help answer some of these questions is simply by connecting organizations along the value chain and across different copper using industries that have an interest in responsible production and to really encourage collective action where that is appropriate um, and helps us scale the impact of, of activities. Um, again, we are also looking for um, external uh, stakeholders such as civil society organizations or NGOs to join us. We do have some um, representation, for example, of um, academia and of civil society in our multi-stakeholder advisory council. So we really want to make sure that the copper mark provides a uh, broad forum for different stakeholders to um, to work together towards a common objective. If you are looking for the copper marks, if you're interested on where you can find information and how are you going to recognize material or sites specifically that carry the copper mark, um, we're committed to making information available and, and to the transparency in everything that we do. So every um, site that has committed to participating in the copper mark signs a letter of commitment. That letter of commitment is published on our website. So you'll be able to see at any point in time which sites have committed to the process, as well as which sites have already completed the independent assessment of their practices. And that's um, through the letter of commitment and through the website. Once the copper producers have completed their assessment and have been able to demonstrate that they don't have any major gaps um, between their performance and the requirements, they will then be able to use the copper mark um, logo and to communicate that either through their reports, um, through the um, through their invoices to their customers, um, etc. So that equally is is um, possible, and more information is available on our website on that as well. We are fairly new in our um, program, so we have launched at the very end of March 2020, uh, a bit more than two months ago now, and launched meaning we have opened our program for applications for copper producers. Since then, we have two sites that have signed up for participation, so you are able to find their letters of commitment um, on the website. We also have a first partner organization that is Ford Motors Company. You can see the logo here. And we have launched our multi-stakeholder advisory council in April. And you can see um, on the slide as well a couple of the organizations that participate um, in this advisory council. It's important uh, to note the importance of this council um, for the copper mark. So that body is really the key group within our governance structure that provides us strategic guidance in terms of the companies, um, the organization's development, um, in terms of our programs, in terms of the development of our programs and where we are going, how we're going to achieve our mission and vision. So it has a very key role and we're really pleased to have the support of such a diverse group of stakeholders. I've mentioned already a little bit um, the, the landscape within which we operate and the recognition that we are really not alone um, in terms of providing this type of initiative. Um, as the Copper Mark, we are very committed to collaboration and to avoid redundancy um, when it comes to providing assurance and, and reporting initiatives. As I've mentioned, we've decided to adopt an existing set of criteria as a first step towards that goal. Um, we recognize existing certifications and assurances of copper producers um, where these are already in place and where they meet the criteria of our standards. Um, so we have already um, published a matrix document with, for now, five standards that we recognize. That is a document that will continue to grow as our process evolves and as there is more sites that participate that already have systems in place. So again, if you have an existing certification in place at your mine site or at your smelter or at your refiner that covers some or all of the copper market criteria, then you do not need to undergo another audit or another on-site assessment for that same criteria that will be accepted as equivalent. One um, project that I wanna take just two minutes on that has evolved a lot, um, has led to a lot of, of interest um, is our collaboration as well with, with other organizations on a joint due diligence standard. So again, an example of the collaboration that we're putting in place. Um, I've mentioned the London Metal Exchange's responsible sourcing policy that of course applies to all 
um, the metals that are traded on the LME. And in order to enable companies to comply with the LME requirements, we have decided to join forces with the associations for nickel, lead and zinc, as well as the Responsible Minerals Initiative that currently holds um, standards and provides assurance mechanisms for other metals that are covered by the LME, including cobalt and um, tin. So with these five organizations, including the Copper Mark, um, we are now developing a joint um, standard. So again, a joint mechanism for any copper, nickel, zinc, or lead brand of the LME to comply with those requirements. Um, that is a little outside of the copper mark framework, and, and you can see here it concerns only one criteria. So the London Metal Exchange's requirements are focused on responsible sourcing, on due diligence on mineral supply chains, and that is criteria 31 for us, just one out of the 32. Um, and hence, if you are just using that joint metal standard, you would only be conforming with one criteria um, rather than all the criteria that we accept for the copper mark. However, we do believe it is a really important step, again, to um, promote the collaboration, use a more efficient way in terms of um, collaborating across metals, providing one solution for those um, metals to comply with the LME, rather than having four different responses across four different industries, recognizing as well that many, in many cases, metals are produced of course, at the same site, they're by the same company. And so we do really hope that creates um, efficiency and lessens the burden for companies that are expected to comply with the LME's uh, requirements. With that, I just want to end my, my quick um, presentation here with a bit of an outlook. So as mentioned, our focus on SDG um, 12, responsible production on mining, smelting and refining this year. Again, that's very much a response to the call for improvements on conditions on the ground, making sure metals are responsibly produced and building that strong foundation upon which we can build. In the longer run, and estimated by 2023, we are looking to expand that scope of the copper market to really create a full value chain system, including a chain of custody element, um, including the participation of downstream actors or downstream actors here, meaning after the refinery towards the end users, so again, fabricators, semi-fabricators, for example, and we'll also be looking at including recycled materials more um, explicitly in our framework. So that is where we're going. And with that, I'll uh, Alexander back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I think based on the first two poll results, it's, uh, what you've just spoken about connects beautifully with this issue of sustainability. And I must say uh, thank you for calling in from Switzerland uh, because this really is a truly global event today. And in some ways, the barriers that COVID has put up for us have actually opened up the opportunities we have to link um, globally. I do have a really good question that came, um, one of them, but this one in particular really stuck for me. How has improved traceability for green copper and advantage an advantage for production in developing jurisdictions? And looking at the location of the person that asked the question, it looks like it's from somewhere that is, is more of a developing economy. So at the moment, um, we are, like I said, focusing on the responsible production at the site um, rather than traceability. It's really interesting that in the consultations with stakeholders, traceability was not as big of a priority to stakeholders than it was um, to really achieve that impact on the ground. Um, and so while we will be working on a chain of custody standard, as I've mentioned, um, we've decided in the beginning to focus at that production level. We do see, of course, with the increased calls for um, due diligence on supply chains and increased expectations that companies understand where copper is coming from um, and making sure that there is a, an ability to manage risks. But again, for now, I would say the calls for traceability have been mostly focused on working backwards in supply chains and understanding provenance of materials um, in order to be able to manage risks associated with um, supply chains rather than um, necessarily a, a, um, a call for trace, tracing copper 
coming out of the mine and, and then towards the end product. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that discussion develops, particularly as we start to um, work more in terms of um, decarbonization and more companies are starting to look at their carbon footprint or starting to try and, and get more information um, in terms of the, the, their, the products that they're producing. And so we'll be, we expect, we'll be um, requesting more and more information around the uh, production practices for copper as well. Thanks, Michelle. And actually just one last question, um, just so I can stay on time. This is actually a question of copper mark itself in terms of these is, you know, the assumption by the, the writer is that there's a payment process, so that if people want to be assessed, they'll pay the copper mark. What sort of governance approaches is copper mark putting in place to protect, I guess, the independence and any potential perceived conflict of interest? That's a great question. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, so yes, indeed, the, the independent assessment um, needs to be conducted by approved assessors of the copper mark. So we have a approval system in place. Um, assessors that are approved by the copper mark are equally identified on our website. Um, and that comes with a strong um, oversight role in terms of us managing or overseeing the quality of the assessors, making sure they have the right competencies, making sure they're free of conflicts of interest, um, and as well as the ability to, for example, shadow assessments um, where the copper producer has um, contracted an assessor and is going through that independent verification um, to really ensure that such conflicts of interest are not um, occurring in the process. So there's various mechanisms we put in place, um, but the key one is really the level of, of um, oversight and the need for assessors to be qualified and approved by the copper mark before they can be contracted by the copper producers. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks for calling in. I know you have to drop off to go to a mother, another meeting. So on behalf of everybody, thanks for calling in this morning from, from the Northern Hemisphere. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. And so to the rest of the participants, um, it's poll time again. So I'll now ask for the poll results to come out. And the question was, will copper prices recover post-COVID or is the global copper market weighed down by other Oh, it looks like a tie, pre-existing issues. Well, it's interesting. Um, clearly, the the issues are predominantly COVID-related, are likely to dissipate, and other issues. So you're really almost 50-50 um, there. And then the third answer, the impact of COVID being peripheral and transitory is about 24%. That's interesting. In many ways, that would reflect what I think Craig's presentation was highlighting, that you know, I know CIU's updating their forecasts weekly um, and has been consistently through COVID because of the rapid pace of change and yet it's clear things could continue to change and nobody can predict what's going to happen and I would argue that that is particularly reflected in your answers. So very interesting. Our next poll question before we go to our final speaker is how is responsible and sustainable production perceived by the market? And as you can see that ties very well into Michelle's presentation. And so to our final speaker uh, for this afternoon, this is an exciting one um, as well, Ashley Brinson. Ashley is Executive Director at the Warren Centre for Advanced Engineering at the University of Sydney. He's known as an inventor, an innovator and a global thinker. He has broad experience in R&D, capital projects and international business expansion. The Warren Centre fosters excellence and innovation in advanced Australian engineering by facilitating relationships among industry, government and academia. Ashley brings us some very good news with an exciting world launch in the work towards the zero emission mine of the future. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Let's see, let's get that first slide up. Uh, my name is Ashley Brinson. I'm the Executive Director of the Warren Centre for Advanced Engineering at Sydney University. Today, I'm sharing an overview of our Zero Emissions Copper Mine of the Future report. This report's available now online for free. The world is changing rapidly. Uh, new technologies make digital systems cheaper and cheaper. Sensors are embedded in machinery now for $1 or $2 per chip. And experts say that the cost of Internet of Things connectivity will fall to $1 per year to connect to the 5G Internet infrastructure of the future. 
As data acquisition costs are cheaper than ever, big data analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are driving a remarkable digital revolution in everyday life. At the same time, the world's societies are reimagining transportation systems, power generation systems, and energy storage systems to lessen our impact on the environment and to reduce carbon emissions to the atmosphere. Solar panels, wind turbines, lithium battery storage systems, electric vehicles, and EV charging stations require large quantities of copper. The same digital revolution and zero emissions transformation in society and the external world is coming to copper production. In some ways, copper mining has been slow to change. Froth flotation technology was a major advance in the last century with strong technology development led from Australian mining engineers. Today, many of the technological advances are digital. GPS, IoT sensors, data analytic systems are off the shelf innovations immediately available. Looking over the horizon, LIDAR, autonomous drilling, artificial intelligence systems, augmented reality, virtual reality, wearable technology, and new water technologies, such as desalinated seawater for mining, are being implemented in new mine sites. Further advances in quantum sensing, 4D modeling, potential dry processing, and alternative novel flotation technologies appear to be within grasp. The technology performance of modern industry coincides with global aspirations to use new technologies for more sustainable development. The Paris Accord is an example of the imagination that by rethinking our problems, we might come to new solutions with more sustainable impact. Scientists tell us that net zero carbon emissions are essential by 2050 to avoid catastrophic changes to our world. In 2015, the United Nations launched its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Copper supply chains have a strong role to play in the delivery of this package of aspirations. Clean and affordable energy, UN Sustainable Development Goal number seven is delivered with copper-connected energy systems. Decent work and economic growth are behind today's conference. A highly recycled metal, copper epitomizes the possibilities for SDG 12, responsible, responsible consumption and production, and SDG 17 emphasizes how partnerships deliver these goals. Future demand for copper, as our CRU man said, is uh, strong. In 2016, the Warren Center issued a copper technology roadmap examining demand for copper in the Asia Pacific region. Midterm and long-term growth forecasts indicate strong demand for copper, especially for housing construction, clean power, and clean transportation for the growing and developing middle classes in Asia. As we know, copper currently, China currently dominates global demand for copper and that nation's production of solar panels, wind turbines, EVs, electrified public transport, and general construction is an ongoing driver of global copper demand. Copper is a strong contributor to Australia's global exports and yields $14 billion to the domestic economy. Preparing Australia's copper export capability to meet changing requirements in minerals provenance and emissions transparency is the goal of copper mark certification. And this approach will secure and improve Australia's position as a global supplier of choice for high value metals. In nation by nation reviews, there are stark contrasts in the greenhouse gas emissions and efficiencies of different copper production supply chains. National comparisons include mine sites with multiple underlying technical differences. A key factor is the ore body type. Oxide ores are converted with hydrometallurgical processes, leaching, solvent extraction, and electrolinning. Sulfide ore bodies are purified with froth, flotation, smelting, and electrolysis. Another significant difference for individual mining sites is the contrast between open cut and underground mining of ore bodies. Loading, hauling, ventilation, Blasting, drilling, and dewatering processes have significantly different energy intensities and resultant emission profiles. There are differences also between carbon emissions from hydrometallurgical and pyrometallurgical processes and the relative global warming footprint of each ore body and its associated subprocesses. The methodology for this report included interviews with 12 international copper mining experts from the industry itself, from academia, from the METS consulting segment, government support agencies, and industry consortiums like METS Ignited, AMIRA, and the International Copper Association. 
These interviews revealed real differences in the aspirations of various players within the industry. Those looking at the possibilities for copper to supply the global energy transformation took a high-level view and a long-range view of the possibilities, while personnel who worked immediately at mining sites described a shorter-term view of limited ambitions and barriers. Sitting in the ICA office in Sydney, Claire Sykes and I discussed with John Fennell about this contrast and aspiration. We discussed what's possible now, what process technologies still need research and development, what technical limitations are locked into mining sites when the location is set, and which ones can be continuously incrementally improved, which changes require breakthrough innovation. Our discussion led us to believe that a significant gap in the industry's progress is a shared vision of the future. Moonshot thinking could change the perception of some of these challenges as being just too hard to confront, or that facing these challenges alone or as individual players is impossible. In 1963, John F. Kennedy described a bold vision. Many believe that it was impossible. Speaking to Rice University in Houston, Texas, Kennedy proclaimed, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one which we are willing to accept, one which we are unwilling to postpone. That sort of unpostponable aspiration is what we see behind the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the global effort to take climate action. Kennedy laid his groundwork. Others had recognized the global race and need for bold action as early as 1957. In 1969, 12 years after the race began, Apollo 11 moon mission delivered what was thought to be impossible. And the whole world cheered when Neil Armstrong took that giant leap. Today, there's a new generation of moonshot thinkers. Jeff Bezos of Amazon is also CEO of Blue Origin Rocket Company. Richard Branson has alliances with Scaled Composites, the winner of the Ansari X Prize in private spaceship development, and Branson has launched Virgin Galactic, a space tourism company. Elon Musk, known for Solar City in the U.S. and for building the world's largest battery in South Australia, and for autonomous driving electric Teslas is also CEO of SpaceX. The Earth itself is not large enough to contain the ambition of SpaceX. The Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rocket systems are breathtaking examples of the power of engineering and modern technology. Until 2015, it was impossible to launch a rocket, disconnect the upper stage, and have the lower stage land back on Earth. Sensors, data analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence broke this paradigm. It's not really about a new rocket engine. It's a collection of $1 IoT sensors connected to machine learning and artificial intelligence systems that deliver extraordinary technical performance. Digital technologies have revolutionized what private companies have achieved. Today, SpaceX regularly rewrites aerospace engineering paradigms. After the Zero Emissions Report was submitted for this conference, another barrier was broken when SpaceX Dragon capsule docked with the International Space Station just 23 days ago. And this is not just an American ambition. Uh, the week before Hurley and Benton docked the Dragon capsule, a Canadian robot arm unloaded payload that was delivered to the ISS by Japan and the European Space Agency. International collaboration and shared ambitions globally are clear in these modern moonshot visions. Coming back down to earth and looking at the challenges of global climate action and how the copper industry can both supply the metal needed for a renewable energy revolution and transform the emissions profile for mining sites, I believe this moonshot thinking and shared vision for the future can be developed and promulgated by collaboration across five stakeholder groups. We need collaboration and leadership from the mining industry, from research and academia sector, from governments such as this webinar sponsored by the South Australian government, from the mining equipment, technology and services sector, and civil society organizations such as AMIRA and the ICA. Finally, this vision for the future has to reflect the aspirations of society. The social mining site, man, community members, the role of copper over the zero computer, above ground in our homes, on our roads, and on our rooftops. Zero emissions performance below the surface and copper production 
supply chains will bolster the integrity of the message that we're in it to win it and that copper is part of the solution. This report that the Warren Center launches today examines those technological innovations in discovery, material movement, ventilation, material process, mineral processing, and water that are necessary to deliver the zero emission mine of the future. The report outlines how policy, programs, collaboration, capital, future skills, and open innovation mindset can deliver step changes that advance innovation. An initial classification of technologies sorts these present and future potential innovations across five impact themes, assesses the technology readiness level and commercial readiness level to identify innovations that are off the shelf ready to implement today. We call these Horizon One. Horizon Two innovations are those that are suitable for tomorrow when an existing mine site under, undergoes asset upgrades or capital expansion. Horizon 3 includes future ore body discoveries, future mine site developments, and future operations where fundamental research and development are required. Download the report. Here's an example of the preliminary tables. The uh, team of researchers have collated initial reviews from the University of Sydney alongside with input of our expert interviews to build an initial review of technical and business risks. It's all in the report. Download the report, read much more. In 1930, the effects of the Great Depression were felt in Australia and around the world. Policymakers trained in the John Maynard Keynes School of Economic Thought argued that future-oriented major infrastructure projects backed with public spending would provide jobs to restart the economy. The Hoover Dam and the Nevada-Arizona border delivered employment through the decade of the 1930s in America and still today provides zero-emission hydroelectric power 90 years after the Great Depression. Collapse of Lehman Brothers in September 2008 triggered the Great Recession of 2009, which swept across America and Europe. The blue landscape on the hills in the right-hand photograph is not water spilling down hydroelectric dam systems. This is the photovoltaic energy panda in Germany, the remarkable transition when intensive renewable energy was converted for photovoltaics. Legislation in 2009, 2010, 2011, created sequential massive economic stimuli to overcome the recession in Europe. Today, governments around the world have already dropped interest rates to a once-in-a-lifetime low. Infrastructure investments are one path governments will take to exit the coronavirus recession, which is underway. I believe the copper industry can align its future with this economic restart and embrace a new path forward for reduced emissions innovation that delivers integrity in the aspiration of the renewable energy future. Uh, to download this report, Google the title, and you'll find the link, Warren Center, Zero Emission Copper Mine of the Future. Uh, the bold vision is not the end. Authenticity plus integrity plus trust will yield the social license required to deliver this vision. Moonshot leaders are needed who say we choose to build this vision. And the next step is deeper engagement, deeper engagement with industry, government, research, and the MET sector to develop the impact themes and levers that can enable innovation. We invite you to come along on this journey. And I express many thanks to John Fennell, to Claire Sykes, to the advanced engineering team at University of Sydney and our 12 insights experts who contributed. I'm Ashley Brunson at the Warren Center for Advanced Engineering. Thank you for attending today. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks very much. I hope I can hold on to you for a couple of minutes just for some Q&A. One of the questions I've had is, in terms of zero emissions, what do you see as one of the greatest barriers for the mining industry at a processing point to be able to achieve that? Uh, we've got five areas of, of processing. Well, uh, discovery is not processing, but the, the different areas are laid out and the carbon intensity of each of these is mapped out in, in the report. Um, incrementally, there's a lot that can be done with data analytics and, and technology, but then there will be those elements of the process that have to be com considerably redesigned with fundamental R&D. And uh, that's, that's part of the next step is taking an inventory. And the answers won't be the same for every mining site. They'll be different depending on the ore body and the processing technology that's there on open core cut and underground courses and a bit different for every site. 
Thanks, Ashley. That's all we have for questions. Congratulations to the Warren Institute. I know publication of this report is a, is a milestone for the team. The report, for those of you who are calling in today, will be available for download um, at the end of this uh, session. So Ashley, thanks again, and uh, no doubt we'll be talking soon. And so back to our poll. And if we go to the poll results for about which the question was, how is responsible and sustainable production perceived by the market? If you, you should be able to see that now. Clearly, um, I would interpret that that the idea or the idea maybe 10 years ago that uh, sustainability or responsible production was a phase or was something that people who weren't from the industry saw as important has clearly changed um, as really it's what, 87, 88.2% of you actually think that it's not only is it a driver for innovation, but it is directly influencing company action and decision making, which makes projects like the Copper Mark and, and others even more relevant. We do have one last poll question. The last poll question is, and it ties to Ashley's topic, how is, pardon me, what is the most important part of the mining process to address in the carbon neutral transition? And whilst you vote on that, I'll just, what I'll do is just wind up because we are coming to the end of the conference. So in terms of recapping, we've heard about new initiatives that uh, the that state of South Australia is putting forward to grow the energy and resources innovation area. We've had updates on the macro forces shaping copper markets. We've heard about the rising trend for responsible copper mining and more recently the work towards a zero emission mine for the future. From all that we've heard, it's very evident that growing copper production to meet future demand is critical. However, copper producers are increasingly mindful of the environmental and the social conditions that are really driving and are demanding um, that producers adapt and evolve their production techniques, their energy sources to meet those expectations. So I would like to thank you all for your participation. Uh, up, up till now, and to all the speakers for your time, noting that uh, other than myself and the Minister, everybody called in from somewhere else today. And if we now look to the final poll question, which is still going, but in the question of time, I'll call it. So clearly, if you look at that, processing is the number one, number one answer, followed by movement of materials. And as we all know, certainly as soon as there's haulage involved, uh, carbon emissions go up and the further we are away from things, uh, the greater the demand on energy. And certainly we've heard and I've heard mentioned um, around the track that the issue of location of not just mining exploration, mine production and processing, reducing that distance is something that there's a lot of talk. What will the impacts of COVID be and, and how will that influence? So we'll close the polls there. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to everybody for calling in for this first COP of the World on, online event. It's the first time we've done this. I know that there's been many firsts for many people in the last few months. Uh, many thanks to our speakers and the minister today, to the team that put this together, who it was the first that they've delivered and they've done very well, and for you for calling in and for your participation. On your interface, you'll see a button at the top with some great downloadable information on the speakers and the Warren report will also be there. We have had some questions about presentations. Will the presentations of the speakers be available? We're looking into that. We will be sending a post event email and we can update you there. But thanks for the question. You will get a, a link to this, to a recording of this event, pardon me, so you can rewatch this um, at your leisure. But we're also very keen to get your feedback and if you have the time, we will be putting a survey out um, as we close this webinar and the tech down. But if you've got a little bit of time to complete the survey, we would really appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks for calling in. We definitely look forward to seeing you at our next Copper of the World event. And we very much hope to see you in person at next year's conference. So thank you all and good afternoon. <laughs>